If I could turn back time. Seriously, if I could start over, right? They always say that hindsight is 2020, and I don't know one person who has lived life to perfection and not looked back with regrets, so why would it be any different for our homeschooling? I have been homeschooling now for eight years and I have a lot of regrets. I have a lot of regrets on things that I did early on that I really wish that I would not have done. And if I had more kids coming up, I would do things so differently. So you may not consider these huge mistakes. I mean, there's grace for making mistakes, right? God is able to redeem what is lost and man, I pray because some of these mistakes I am so ashamed of. But I had to tell you about them because if you're a new homeschool mom or if you're a younger homeschool mom, please heed my advice. Consider it at least. Maybe you can learn from my mistakes. So I don't know how many I'm gonna end up doing because a lot of times when I do these lists, I end up remembering things as I'm talking through them. But I will definitely say there's more than 10, okay? So stick with me on all these. My very first regret is that I did not pay more attention to read alouds. There are like, there are two kinds of homeschool moms. The ones that just gather all the books and they read all the things and they love, they just love books. I am not that mom. Tell me if this was true for anybody else, but my very first year homeschooling, I was not used to talking all day long. I had a job where I sat in front of a computer and I was talking at work, but I had plenty of downtime where I was not talking. And I'm not kidding you, my first few weeks of homeschooling, my jaw hurt. I was like not used to talking that much. And so reading aloud was actually uncomfortable for me. I don't know, reading aloud was just one of the things that if I felt like we were not getting everything done, it was the thing that I kind of was like, eh, we don't need to read aloud. I had a two-year-old, I had a five-year-old, and I had a eight or nine-year-old, I can't remember how old he was. We read some books aloud. So I won't say that I neglected it completely, but now, looking back because my kids are not devourers of books they don't really enjoy reading that much and i kind of look back and say is that because of me when you read a book to a child they associate that with love because they're snuggling with you you're introducing them to great stories and great literature so you're unlocking that imagination that they have and i i'm not kidding i i wonder like did i miss out on an opportunity here because i didn't read aloud enough to them and so every single year I feel like I'm trying harder and harder let's do read alouds like there's more value in just reading through books than we give it credit for and so with that here's one of the other things that I regret that has contributed to my children's maybe not going for the books <laughs> And I think a lot of you younger moms are more attentive to this than I was. But when my son was five or six years old, that's when the iPod Touch came out. Maybe it was out a little bit before then, but it was kind of new. It was a newer thing. So we were just getting used to constantly having a screen at our fingertips. And I remember when he was five or six years old, we found some games and we were handing him our iPod and he was getting into the video games. It wasn't until a couple years later where all of a sudden I realized he doesn't play with his toys anymore. <laughs> all he wants is video games. All he wants is the iPod. All he wants is our phone. So that's just one of those things. Again, I feel like, did I ruin my child's imagination? They have had a pull towards video games ever since, and I feel like I'm constantly trying to incentivize them to play, to especially my younger one now, to play with her toys. We have a whole playroom, like go do some crafts. <sighs> so keep your kids away from devices as long as possible. And I gotta say that one has even contributed to now me wondering, okay, which child can handle some of their classes online? You know, one of my most popular videos is why we are no longer using teaching textbooks. Not necessarily because of teaching textbooks. I don't know, that's too hard to tell because every child learns differently and they learn at different paces. But I will say for my middle child, I don't think she can handle being in front of the computer. It's too much of a distraction. It's too much of a temptation to open up a window and 
and look for something else. So some children can handle that and some cannot. Because of our experience with teaching textbooks, it's just going to make me pause now with any sort of online learning. They have to have some a certain level of maturity and a certain level of supervision. So how much security do you have on your computer? How much supervision are you going to be able to hover around them all the time? And man, tell me if you're like me. I miss the old civil days before the internet. <laughs> Another regret I have, and this one maybe doesn't necessarily have to do with homeschooling, although I do think it has a lot to do with homeschooling because chores, right? Being part of a team, being part of the family. My kids do do chores, but there's one thing that nags on me all the time that I did not train them when they were younger to make their bed every day. It's one of those things like when you're trying to say, okay, let's go make our bed. like. It seems like the one habit that, why is this habit so hard? It's hard for even me and my husband because my husband doesn't want to make the bed either. And so if he's the last one out of bed, it's not going to get made. <laughs> and so making the bed just makes you feel good, doesn't it? It makes your room feel clean. It makes it feel tidy. And you can immediately see what else needs to be put away. So I wish that I would have taught my children as soon as they were toddlers, the value of making a bed so that when they became school age even, it was just a part of their routine. I didn't have to keep making it a chore. And along those same lines, even chore training. I have my kids do chores and I tell them what to do, but when they were younger, I didn't take the time when life was slower to say, here's how you dust and here's, you know, like if you're dusting the living room, here's how we do it. Here's all the pieces that we go to like step by step and maybe take a month to train them. And so I had to do it when they were older. It just would have been nice if by the time they were older, I could just be divvying out chores and have them do it. So the younger you can train your kids in these habits, do it. Okay, my next regret is about homeschooling and that is in the early years. I started homeschooling when my oldest was in third grade. My middle child was a kindergartner and my youngest was a toddler. I did not know what I was doing and so I ordered my Father's World, which is a wonderful curriculum. I love their kindergarten program. I love their second, third grade American history program, but I'm not gonna lie, it was a lot. It was a lot for me anyway. <laughs> I did not get all the things done. And because we came from a Christian school and I was public schooled, I kind of knew what I wanted my homeschool to look like, but I didn't know how to do it. And I didn't have a whole lot of people around me helping me figure out my vision. And so I just bought the box curriculum because that was the easy thing to do. I just felt like I was always behind, trying to get all the things done, trying to do too much. And now having been in it eight years, man, if I could do it all over again, I don't, th I don't know that I would have bought my father's world. There's a lot of things about my father's world that I really do love. So I, so I really do say that with caveat because I, I like made, I have a scrapbook of our first year homeschooling and I look back on that and think we did do a lot of fun things. But I just remember in that moment, I felt like I'm not getting it done. I'm not doing enough. And I, I really, really felt like in that moment, I wanted to read picture books with my kids. So I neglected the read alouds because I felt like we had to do these other things too. But really, every time we went to the library, I was like, oh, I just want to read these books. Or I would get a fun documentary. Oh, I just want to watch this movie with my kids and snuggle. Or, oh, I just want to do these crafts. Or My Father's World on, on their weekly schedule had a nature walk on it. I, I wish I knew what that was. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't even really comprehend what a nature walk was. I hadn't done enough research yet. So I didn't do that stuff. I just tried to get the science and the history and the language arts and the math. So if I had to do it over again, while my kids were young, I would get math, I would teach them how to read, I would get them some handwriting, and I would do interest-led learning. I would read books. I would read books on whatever they were interested in. I would go to more parks. I would get outside. I would do fun field trips. I would get together with other friends, and I would enjoy being a family. 
That's what I would do if my kids were young. Okay, another one of my regrets was worrying too much about grade level and where my child should be at. And I will give you a perfect example of this. When my middle child was first grade, she actually kind of taught herself how to read. So we didn't even get halfway through my father's world kindergarten and she was reading like we hadn't even got through all the phonics and everything. She was one of those that just figured it out. I, I quit doing my father's world kindergarten and we switched to logic of English, which again, foundations, the, the lower level is a fantastic curriculum. We had so much fun with that, but I don't know if it's still labeled like this. It was when I was doing it, but it said the foundations level was for ages four to seven. So it had like all the phonics cards and teaching them how to spell words phonetically and all kinds of fun games. And it was a great curriculum for learning how to read and, and learning some basic grammar and all that and spelling words. But when my daughter was eight, we weren't through the foundations. So they have their foundations curriculum for ages four through seven was split up in A, B, C, and D. We were almost done with B, but she was eight years old. And I saw that little label that said ages four to seven. She loved doing logic of English. It was like our fun subject for the day. For some reason though, I was like, ah, she's too old to keep doing this. So I need to switch over to the essentials program, which is what they recommend again for eight years old and up. So I had her take the placement test to figure out where we needed to start, which was at the beginning. And we started doing this essentials program, which was a lot meatier, a lot more boring. It was a struggle. She didn't want to do it. It was a lot more work. It was like the learning stopped and we were struggling and I was still fairly new homeschool mom so I really didn't understand what was going on and then we started having tears because I was frustrated and she was frustrated and we were starting every lesson with prayer because that's how stressful it was like Lord just please help us get through this lesson with no tears traumatic <laughs> and I would like to say that my daughter has recovered from that I mean there is so much mom guilt <laughs> Like, did I ruin my child? I did find out later because she was struggling so much with her handwriting and struggling with her spelling that she had ADHD. But part of me like looks back and go, I should have stuck with foundations. It was working and it was doing fine. And who cares about grade level and who cares that this says, oh, recommended for ages four to seven. It was working and it was fine. And I wish that I wouldn't have cared. So if it's not broke, don't fix it. So this next regret actually is like right in sync with that, but this one I'm labeling as comparison. So it's kind of like the grade level, but also comparing your children to other children and thinking this is where they're supposed to be, or this is what they're supposed to be able to do. My first year of homeschooling, my son would read a story or I would tell him a story and then he's supposed to orally narrate it back or he's supposed to write something back to me. And I didn't understand why he couldn't do it. And I regretfully say that I would get frustrated at him and, th and think that it was him just not wanting to do it or not trying. And the same thing with my daughter with her spelling words, we practiced them over and over and over and over again and she could not spell these words. Again, this was before she was diagnosed with ADHD, but I know that that frustration showed on me because I personally could not relate to these struggles. I don't want to say I was a gifted child, but I never struggled with school. I did struggle with reading comprehension, so, but that was about it. Like, I never struggled with math, I never struggled with spelling. Like, I have a, a very photographic memory sometimes. Like, you show me once and I got it. But my children are, are not wired the same as I am. And so what I didn't realize at the time probably again because modern education says all of these kids are supposed to go from kindergarten to first grade to second grade all at the same level and so even though we say that there's freedom in homeschooling where we don't have to do that that mindset is so hard to break and i caught myself doing it i was frustrated that my children were not learning at the level at which I thought they were supposed to be doing and unfortunately at times I let my own frustration show. Huge regrets. 
I, I think I saw this somewhere online recently. You may plant seeds in the ground and plants, flowers may start to come up, but they are not gonna bloom at the same time. They will bloom when they are ready, and so will your children. So if you have a choice between getting the homework done and the academics or your relationship with your child, choose the relationship every time. I don't know how to phrase this next regret, except to say, do not allow yourself to be confined to one learning style. This is another one that I feel like I've broken out of this chain. Again, your first couple years of homeschooling, you don't necessarily think about this, that your children all learn differently. So what worked for your older child may not work for your second child. So like your older child may be an auditory learner while your second child may be more geared for kinesthetic things, right? I'm gonna read you a comment that I saw. I don't remember where I saw this, but I kept the comment. So I think it must have been on Facebook or somewhere like that. But I totally agree with this comment, and so I wanna share it with you. It says, so with not let, making yourself be confined to a learning style or a certain homeschool flavor. For example, I'm going to buy this curriculum and all of my kids are going to use it. It only took to my number two kid to realize my mistake, but I have witnessed so much frustration that others have faced because they refuse to relinquish a specific curriculum or teaching style because, well, it worked with my older kids. Your kids are all unique. And while the curriculum is a tool and sometimes you can take one curriculum and you can present it differently, there may be times where you just need to look for a different way. So just keep an open mind, you do not have to use one particular curriculum. There is no perfect curriculum. There is no curriculum that is the best. There's a curriculum that is the best for you and your child, but across the board, there's not one curriculum that's going to work for everybody. So now that we're on the topic of curriculum, another regret I have is allowing the curriculum to dictate to us rather than us dictating to the curriculum. So what do I mean by that? Well, is it only a science lesson if it comes from a curriculum? Or is science also maybe when you're going outside and observing nature and observing what the birds are doing, observing the way that the wind's blowing and the trees are bending, or you know, observing an ant trail and how they are. Man, have you ever seen when ants are swarmed on top of food, there's like millions and thousands. Those things are so fascinating to observe. Well, is that science? What if you just wanna find a YouTube video on whales and you watch a fun documentary on whales? Is that science? It wasn't from a curriculum though. The curriculum is a tool. You know, one year I bought five units from, five science units from The Good and the Beautiful and we did two of them. Does that mean that I didn't do science? No, I absolutely did science but we did not just do one lesson a day. We did one lesson and we explored outside of the curriculum on that topic for a while. I had my kids do their own research and create new projects for those science topics. It's still science, even if it's not in a curriculum. So then my next regret, and I don't regret this anymore, I have Okay, well, maybe a little bit sometimes. <laughs> sometimes with like math and language arts, I do get a little bit concerned if we're not going to finish the curriculum, but I am slowly learning to let this go. But do you ever feel regret if you don't finish the workbook? If you have a language arts curriculum that's 120 lessons and let's say you only got to lesson 80, is that okay? What if you didn't do that book one day and you let your children write a movie script or you let them write a different paper about a different topic or you just read books all day. That's language arts. 
if you don't finish the workbook, is it the end of the world? And I'm not the only experienced homeschool mom that thinks this because I heard a podcast last year sometime from Sarah McKenzie. She said the exact same thing. In fact, she also said she wishes that she would have put more emphasis on books and reading aloud, which is so ironic since that's her like business is the read aloud revival. But she wishes that she would have done that even more. And she wishes that she would not have stressed about that she did not finish the curriculum for the year. Were you learning every day? Then you were good. One thing that we did do that I just wish that we would have done more of, and I kind of already alluded to this, was when my kids were younger, part of the My Father's World curriculum was to create a book basket. So they would give you all kinds of book recommendations in the back of the teacher's manual. They're kind of a unit study, Charlotte Mason, classical flavor. They had book lists in the back of their teacher's manual for the book basket. And the book basket was just like the buffet of books that you put in a basket that had to do with the topics you were learning about that week. And then you would set aside 20 or 30 minutes in the day where your child could go pull whatever they wanted out of the book basket and just spend time in the books. So I made sure that we went to the library every week because I always put on hold the books that were suggested and then we would often explore and bring home other books. And I know I found myself just wanting to read these library books. I wanted to explore science through the books that we picked out. I wanted to explore, my son was really into history. He loves American history so even since he was in third grade he was into the who was books he was into the you wouldn't want a books or if I lift lived during blah 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 books like we would bring home tons of these books and he would want to read them and I just felt like I was always like uh, we really need to do the curriculum or we really need to to get to this lesson but <laughs> there's a ton of learning just from the library books if you just want to read books lean into that also, our library, they had a plethora of DVDs, not just movies, but learning DVDs, um, Schoolhouse Rocks types DVDs. And when my kids were younger, they loved those DVDs, especially the Schoolhouse Rocks. And there's Schoolhouse Rocks about history, there's Schoolhouse Rocks about math, there's all kinds of Schoolhouse Rock videos. All kinds of stuff you can just learn a ton from. If that's what you want to do, like, especially when your kids are young. Just do it. Don't be tied to a curriculum. And so with that, and with what Heidi St. John refers to as the wonder years, when your kids are younger and they are just full of wonder and they want to learn and they are open to you introducing them to all kinds of new ideas, I wish that I would have just slowed down and I would have just introduced them to all kinds of ideas. I really didn't need a curriculum. I wish that I would have looked more into nature walks, into what, how to make those more creative. Intrigued by notebooking, but at the same time, notebooking feels like busy work to me. But taking some sketchbooks outside in nature and drawing a tree, drawing a scene, noticing the colors, doing a, a rainbow collection. I had a video, day in the life video, where my daughter collected the rainbow on our nature walk, that was fun. You know, you can look up science experiments. They love mixing stuff together. Usborne has all kinds of cool science books where you don't need a formal science curriculum to do that stuff. I just wish that when my kids were younger and we had more of the ability and less pressure, looking back now anyway, I felt the pressure back then, but looking back, I should not have felt pressure to do so much curriculum. We could have learned how to sew, we could have learned how to knit while they were more open to doing those things. While, you know, now my 15 year old, he's thinking about if he wants to go to college. He doesn't have as much time to explore those sorts of things as he did before. I mean, he's doing school six, seven hours a day to earn the credits that most colleges would want him to earn. You have time to do that when your kids are younger. And so this is my final regret. And I say this with all sincerity because when we started homeschooling, okay, no, I knew three people who homeschooled, but two of them were kind of more along the traditional lines. And traditional isn't really me. I, I had a picture in my mind of what I thought homeschooling was gonna be. And then I boxed myself in with a curriculum. And somebody told me when we started homeschooling, 
to not go to a homeschool convention because I would be so overwhelmed with information and so just get one homeschool year under your belt and then go to a homeschool conference. I wish that I would have went to a homeschool conference <laughs> because I would have been exposed to Charlotte Mason, unschooling, interest-led learning. I would have been exposed. I probably would have learned about nature walks and all the lifestyle that I wanted to have. I could have asked people with different perspectives questions about that and I would have seen all the different curriculum that there was available because when I first started homeschooling the only curriculums that I knew of were Abeka, Bob Jones, and My Father's World. That's it. Oh, and Sunlight. Those were the only four that I had ever even heard of. And so those were the only four that I looked into. And now, looking back, I'm super eclectic. Like I, I don't box myself in with anything and each of my child I evaluate individually. But being a new homeschooler, I wish that I would have went to a homeschool conference where I could have seen new ideas and tried different things. Maybe my homeschool could have been what I wanted it to be earlier. If you wanna see what a homeschool conference is like, check out this video right here. I vlogged my state's Christian homeschool convention and met some famous people. And for more homeschool regrets, because I have them for high school also, you guys, check out my regrets. Until next time, bye.